One of the most common questions I get is, what should I plant for pollinators? As you'll hear in today's conversation, I'm not the only one who frequently gets that question. It's probably the most common question asked of anyone who promotes pollinator gardening. And there really isn't a simple answer to that question, because there are lots of different factors that go into determining the best plants for any given area or situation. However, research into this topic can help give us clues as to what might be good plants to consider for our own gardens. In today's episode, we talk about some research into this topic that is coming out of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, please visit my Patreon page. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Today we are joined by Dr. Laura Russo. Laura is an assistant professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee. Hi, Laura. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, thanks for having me on. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation because you and your colleagues have been doing some really interesting research about pollinator preferences and garden settings. And that's a topic that I am always interested in learning more about. And I know that many of our listeners are the same way and really like to learn about that topic. Yeah, in a lot of ways, gardeners are great friends of uh, pollinator conservation. Yes. And I think it's becoming more so really because, I mean, so often people are wanting to plant for butterflies or plant for hummingbirds or songbirds or bees or really you name it. I mean, I think really more and more people are becoming interested in that. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of interest in uh, promoting different kinds of pollinators these days, as opposed to just ornamental varieties of plants that are aesthetically pleasing. Which is really nice to see coming from a wildlife biology, ecology background myself. But before we start talking too much about your research and those findings, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got interested in studying pollinators? So uh, I've been in this field for a long time, and I was interested when I was younger in plants, uh, especially invasive plants. So when I started grad school, I had joined the lab of uh, a researcher who studied invasive thistles. That's Katrina Shea at Penn State University. Uh, when I first joined her lab, I was primarily interested in you know, how the plant species affected local ecological communities, but I had never taken an entomology course. So I knew basically nothing about insects. I always loved bugs when I was a kid. Even when I was three, I used to play with ants all the time, but I, that wasn't my plan when I entered grad school. And when I was first starting out, one of the things that was recommended to me was to go to the field and look at the organism in its field setting and use that as a way to generate ideas. So I went to the field and I was looking at these thistles that were blooming in a field and they were just covered with insects. Uh, I didn't know what the insects were. I didn't know how to identify them. I knew nothing about them. But the thought that occurred to me was, you know, an invasive plant species enters a novel ecosystem and all of these insects have already found it and know how to use it and know how to utilize the resources it provides. So I became interested in evaluating how invasive plants change insect communities as they invade novel ecosystems. Uh, and I constructed a massive field experiment where I had controlled garden communities with or without the presence of the thistle. So the presence of the thistle was the experimental treatment. And then I monitored the insect community uh, very passively because I knew nothing about insects. So I didn't know what I would be collecting. I didn't target anything over the course of two years. And I invented my own insect trap to collect them because I had no money. And I then after collecting 40,000 insects in this experiment, I started teaching myself to identify them. 
So I was processing them, just happened evenings, weekends, I would sit at the microscope and I'd go through this massive collection of insects. And I had books and I was reading and trying to learn to identify them. First, I sorted them all to the order level. Um, so Lepidoptera, moths, butterflies, uh, Diptera, which is flies, and Hymenoptera, which is ants, bees, and wasps, uh, and so on. There were more orders, but those are the most common. And then I learned at the order level, only this order, Hymenoptera, was responding significantly to the presence of this one. So I learned to identify the families of Hymenoptera. And when I learned the families of Hymenoptera, what I realized that was that only this group of families known as the Anthophila or the flower loving, the bee families were responding to the presence of this thistle. So that was how I learned about bees. I didn't know anything about them before that. I came from this you know, top down uh, learning process naively knowing nothing about the system. And it turned out that bees are a fascinating study system because they are very opportunistic about the way they use resources. So they'll shift their resource use within a single summer if the quality of the resources changes. They're very picky. So they're selective about the types of flowers that they'll visit. Uh, and they're also really important parts of the ecosystem. They provide these valuable pollination services. So overall, I, the more I learned about bees, the more fascinated I became by them, and they became central to my research topics over the years. Uh, so even though I broadly build myself as a community ecologist who's interested in mutualistic interactions or mutually beneficial interactions, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about bees. <laughs> And, and that's really interesting, too, because it just shows how an interest in one big thing, you start looking and that's, oh, what's that? And you, you just keep going narrower and narrower until it's you're so deep down a hole and you never know where you're going to go. I, I find that really fascinating. And I've heard variations on the story from so many different people. And really, in many ways, that's the way my love of pollinators and yes. bees and insects came. So, yeah. Yeah, ecology is, is so fascinating because it's endless. You're always learning something new about it. Um, and entomology, you know, study of insects, is also one of those fields where you can never totally master it. You're always learning about new insects you've never heard before. They're infinitely complex and fascinating creatures. So uh, I think once you start studying it, you become obsessed with it. <laughs> Yes, definitely. And then you've got all the behaviors and the interactions between this species and yes. that species. And does it change if you add this third one? And, and yeah, you can, it's endless. Yes. The other advantage of bees is that they are adorable. Um, they are so cute. And so it's easy to spend a lot of time looking at them with their, you know, fluffy hair and their big eyes. They're just adorable creatures. So <laughs> So they're ma they make an easy study system. They're very easy on the eyes. Yeah, it helps when you've got a cute little, pretty little yes. subject to look at. Yes. Well, I think it's safe to say that pretty much anyone who's planting native plants for pollinators in their gardens are going to want to make the biggest difference they can with those plants because none of us have unlimited space. Some of us have bigger garden areas than others, but it's never unlimited. So we have to pick and choose. And there's a lot of anecdotal information out there about what flowers are more attractive or most attractive to pollinators in general, or this group of pollinators or that group of pollinators. But that anecdotal information is not always backed up by science or disproved by science. Sometimes there just isn't any inf scientific information about it. Yeah. It can go either direction. And in, even more so, I think, in garden settings. And some of the garden experiments that I've seen, it's not always what you would think it would be, especially comparing garden settings to more wild or what we'll call natural settings. So I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on in there and things to be studied. And then you and your colleagues have kind of addressed at least a portion of that recently, working on a three-year study um, with a report that you just published recently with the University of Tennessee Knoxville's Extension Service. And that was on planting for pollinators in East Tennessee. And I think research like that is so incredibly helpful because 
it gives us that scientific background to say, yeah, these plants really are really attractive to pollinators, at least in this area. And thus are ones that as homeowners who are wanting to plant for pollinators, we might want to consider them because they're going to give us a lot of bang for our buck. But can you tell us a little bit about that research and kind of give us an overview of it? Yeah, so we're trying to accomplish multiple goals at the same time with these research studies. The way I design them, it's very labor intensive because I'm trying to control for all of these outside variables. One of the reasons why there's not a lot of scientific research on this topic of preference is that to truly establish preference, is an incredibly difficult challenge. Yes. Um, so, you know, we set up these controlled garden plots that are replicated at the landscape level, and we control everything from the number of individuals of each plant species, the number of different plant species, the size of the plots, how often they're watered, how often they're weeded, where we accessed or where we obtained the plants from in the first place. <laughs> how often they're surveyed, um, the way that they're treated over winter, the kind of composting and mulch that they receive. So as you can imagine, this requires a lot of work to replicate over a long period of time. And even though we have 18 native perennials in the study, that's still a small subset of the total number of native plant species in Tennessee. And immediately after we published the extension publication, complaints were coming in that we didn't have people's favorite plant in the study. Um, but as you can imagine, every plant species we add increases the size of the study uh, to the power of N. So that you know is a limitation. So there were multiple motivators for a study like this and multiple goals that we're trying to achieve at the same time. One is that the public, what they ask me most often when they reach out to me is, what should I plant in my garden? So one of the goals has always been to provide those evidence-based recommendations for pollinator plantings in your yard um, or in any land that you manage for pollinator plantings in agricultural settings as well, for example. And that evidence-based recommendation is lacking from a lot of those you know, recommendations. I've even seen tomatoes build as pollinator friendly in the store, which is strange. But um, <laughs> yes. But you know, for example, we have to spend years collecting this data before we can establish that preference. Uh, so that was one goal: is we always want to provide those recommendations with science behind them. Uh, another goal is that we're really interested in the nutrition of these pollinators. So just like you and I, pollinators need a diverse diet in order to be healthy. They need protein. They need lipids and carbohydrates. Uh, and one of our goals is to better understand how the nutrition provided by these little resources, so pollen and nectar, contributes to foraging preferences and behavior in the field. Uh, obviously, there's a very diverse set of responses to that. So we probably have 500 species of bees in Tennessee. I'm not sure about Kentucky, uh, but it's probably between 400 and 500. Yeah, same neighborhood usually. Yeah. <laughs> And those bees, you know, they have different periods of activity, they have different foraging preferences, and they have different nutritional needs. So that's one subset of the study. It's just that baseline nutritional information. Uh, another part of the study is better understanding how plants communicate with bees using volatile communication. So I have a postdoctoral researcher, Anne Murray, Dr. Anne Murray who is studying the volatile compounds produced by the flowers and how that relates to their nutritional attributes um, and how bees respond to those volatile compounds. Ooh. And <laughs> so we have undergraduate researchers, you know, one undergraduate researcher, Destiny Matheson, she's interested in uh, the size and shape of the corolla of each different plant species and how that affects the pollinators that can utilize those resources. Um, I have one researcher, Sydney Baldwin, who's studying pollination in the field and whether these plants are pollinator limited. So are they getting their full seed set? Do they need more pollinators? Um, I have another undergraduate researcher who's just studying proteomics in this pollen. So to better understand how proteins are developed in a molecular basis. Um, and, and then beyond that, I've had graduate students who are interested in how land use around the site affects the pollinator visitation within these gardens. 
So they're using ArcGIS and the National Land Cover Database to catalog land use at a two kilometer radius around each site and then relate that to pollinator behavior within the garden. Um, trying to think of what other issues we have. So we have like multiple different objectives. There's the more basic research, you know, better understanding nutrition and foraging behavior. Uh, volatiles, and then there's the outreach component where we're providing recommendations based on these preferences to the broader public. And what we're hoping our ultimate goal is to encourage not just pollinator plantings, but pollinator plantings that actually contribute to a healthy, nutritious diet for the pollinators themselves. So rather than just planting something that's you know easily available but not nutritious, uh, planting something that really has a high bank rates buck for nutrition, basically. Yeah, I really like that because the whole nutritional aspect is one that's usually not brought up very often. I find it very fascinating. Just listening to you name off all these things that's going on in your lab. I'm thinking we could just like have a whole month or two where we just talk to everybody <laughs> in the lab because you got so many interesting things going on. Yeah, working with a team of researchers is really exciting because they all come with different ideas and different questions. And uh, that's one of the rewarding aspects of science, I think, is collaborating with other researchers. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, when you were setting up this experiment, were you doing the gardens as a mixed species garden or were they they're just like one single species in that plot? How did you do that? Yeah, because I consider myself a community ecologist, I'm, I'm always looking at communities of plants at a time. So always multiple species. Um, the size of that community has varied depending on the experiment I'm running at any given time. For this experiment, each plot, uh, like garden plot, you could call it, or research plot, depending on your perspective, uh, contains six species. There are four different plot types. So each of the three plant families, Asteraceae, Lamiaceae, and Fabaceae, that's the sunflower family, the mint family, and the legume family, uh, is represented by six species. And so there are three plots that are just that plant family. So six species of asters, six species of mints, six species of legumes. And then there's a fourth plot that is a combination plot that contains two species from each family. So it has still six species, so the same overall species richness, mm -hmm. but now we're mixing the different families of plants. Then within each species of plant, we have four individuals and they're all perennials. So four individuals per species times six species times four plots times five landscapes. You have an idea of how many plants are involved. <laughs> yes, so, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was kind of curious with that, um, especially with some of the research that I've read that like some specific pollinator species, they prefer smaller plot sizes of the same individual species. Some like to have the larger plot sizes that are more attracted to larger numbers. And so, yeah, that was one of the things I was kind of curious with. Yeah, we didn't test for that. We had to control for the size in order to compare the things we wanted to compare, and, which is using a fixed size to understand preference among the plants. Exactly. And no one study can ever, ever <laughs> answer all the questions or look at all the possible variables. You uh, yeah, give us some it. grant money and we'll do it. I, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, you'll test for every single flowering plant in the state of Tennessee, correct? Yeah, it'll just take the rest of my life, but we'll get there. Just keep funding us and we'll keep answering these questions you want us to uh, answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and probably the careers and lifetimes of several of your students. Too. Yes, definitely. <laughs> So yeah. we all we all love working with plants and insects. So you know, th there's no reason why we wouldn't want to do the work, um, other than we're you know time and resource limited. So there's only so many things we can work on in a given time. But uh, if we had infinite time and infinite resources, we would 100% go through every native plant species in Tennessee and try different plot sizes and combinations and everything. Uh, and then once you finish that, you keep going to the other surrounding states as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Then we then we would replicate the experiment in Kentucky and North Carolina. <laughs> but yeah, so what we keep talking about pollinators. Sure. And we keep saying pollinators and we're falling into the same trap that 
everybody does. And that's pollinators are one thing. And we both know pollinators are not one thing, even yeah. within bees. Bees are not one thing. True. I mean, there are so many different ways that we can break this down into smaller and smaller groups. Um, so when you guys were looking at, what were you looking at under the term pollinators? And again, understanding that you can't break it down infinitely because time, resources, everything we were just laughing about with the plants is yes. again true with the pollinators. Well, so we, when we're doing our pollinator survey, which we have a very standardized methodology so that we can replicate this and compare across plant species and across plots and sites and things like that. We use an insect vacuum. So it's a modified dust devil uh, <laughs> with a little collection chamber on the end. And we sample all of the inflorescences of a given plant species within a plot for five minutes. And then we just repeat that over and over again for every plant species in bloom and every plot and every site. Uh, from the beginning of the flowering season through the end of the flowering season. So any insect that contacts the reproductive parts of the flower, that is the anthers or the stamens, within that five minute period is collected and stored and identified. Now our taxonomic skills, again, I have that bee bias. So the bees, we all identify the species and bees, especially native wild bees, comprise 75% of the collections that we've done over the past few years. So they do make up the bulk of the visitors. Uh, the other 25% is a mixture of other kinds of flower visiting insects, including a large number of flies, uh, including hoverflies and the family Sorphidae, which we uh, have a special interest in as well because they're obligately flower visiting. But also there are flower visiting wasps. Uh, Eastern Tennessee has some beautiful flower visiting wasps. I really love them. Uh, we also have a very small number of butterflies, primarily skippers, but they represent, in terms of total numbers, a small percentage of the total visitors. Uh, and then things like beetles and true bugs and other things that are sometimes found visiting flowers for a variety of reasons. So pollinators, we wouldn't use that in a scientific publication because we haven't necessarily shown evidence that they are affecting pollination. Uh, except for my student, Sydney, who is actually doing a pollination study where she's measuring the seed set of the plants. Uh, otherwise, we call them flower visiting insects. So that, that's our general category. And we do have upwards of 20,000 insects that we've collected over the course of this study that we've identified and labeled and sorted. And the amount of time we spend collecting versus processing and identifying those specimens is like a 20-80 rule, 20% 20 of the time collecting, 80% of the time processing, labeling, identifying, sorting, databasing, and analyzing. <laughs> uh, so it's a big process. It's not the kind of thing that anyone can casually go out and replicate. It's one of the reasons why a study like this takes so much time and resources. Um, just in the taxonomic skills alone can take years to develop those kinds of skills. Yeah, exactly. And then when you're looking at a grad student, I mean, they've only got a few years to become proficient and identifying, get the research done, and then they're gone. They're, they're off to something else. So yeah, it can be really hard with studies like this. Yes, the graduate students are impressive in their ability to learn. I mean, most of them are teaching, taking classes, and doing research all at the same time and being paid on a very small stipend. So uh, everyone should respect graduate students if they're not yes. working for these. <laughs> um, but, you know, their abilities are limited. So for a master's student who's expected to complete their program in two years, learning all of the taxonomic identification skills is not realistic. But that's why we work as a team, you know, we help each other. And I have my specimens verified by a qualified taxonomist. So after we've sorted and identified them, then specimens, I take them usually to Sam Drogi of the USGS to have them verified. Then we can have a voucher collection of verified specimens. So if anybody wanted to check the identifications later, they could access that voucher specimen uh, collection, which is stored at the University of Tennessee in my lab. And having those vouchers is always important. It's part of science and being able to go back and double check other people's results or see if you get the same results in a different state yes. or something like that. 
and insect identification changes over time. So oh, yeah. um, it, there might be a, something that's called one species that ends up being two species, and someone might want to come back later and figure out whether we have one or the other in our collection. Uh, so it's important to keep those voucher specimens for future use, but it is time intensive. <laughs> Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's always the, the data processing is always the most time intensive part with it. It is. Yeah, the whole study design, even though it is well controlled and well replicated, is labor and time intensive. So that's the downside. Yeah. Okay. You kind of hinted at this before when you were saying that people were immediately writing you and saying, hey, why did you do my favorite <laughs> one? Why did you pick the ones that you picked? There's lots of reasons that go into selecting the plants that we used here. And it, there's a lot of constraints primarily. So we can't just pick any species we want. For example, one of the first constraints you'll find is that we need to be able to find this species. We need to be able to find enough individuals to replicate this on the scale that I'm talking about. So four individuals per plot times four plots times eight five sites. So not all plant species, native plant species are available in those numbers if we wanna be able to purchase them. Uh, the next constraint is that we wanted to purchase all of the plants from the same source material. So from the same commercial source, which in this case was Overhill Gardens, which is a native plant nursery in Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee. Um, so those are two constraints and you'd be surprised at how quickly that narrows down your list of plant species. <laughs> The third constraint was in the original grant proposal that I wrote for this project, because I was interested in nutrition, I wanted to compare three plant families that provide very different kinds of nutrition pollinators. Uh, and the three most commercially available plant families, which you may know if you've been shopping for new plants are the Asteraceae, the Lamiaceae, and the Bacchaceae. So already my three plant families were relatively fixed just by their accessibility. These also happen to be plant families that are very important to visiting insects, flower visiting insects. They are three of the real heavy hitters in the pollinator world. Um, and they're interesting for different reasons. So the Asteraceae, the sunflower family, is just incredibly diverse. Uh, <laughs> they have so many species here and they're all fascinating. I love asters, but they provide these really easily accessible resources. So their flowers are really open, they're really large and showy, mm -hmm. and the resources are just out there for any flower visiting uh, insect access. But there are some published studies suggesting that the pollen from these flowers is not that healthy for flower visiting insects. So some studies have shown that they tend to be very high in fat and very low in protein. So this could mean that as a family, the sunflowers provide an easy and abundant resource that is not that nutritious. So that's one question. The mint family, the Lamiaceae, which most gardeners love for their you know, wonderful smells and they're pretty easy to grow and they spread easily. Um, they don't provide very much pollen. They do provide some pollen, but it tends to be very small quantities and a little bit challenging to access. Mostly what the mints provide is some nectar. So they provide these copious quantities of nectar, but they are primarily a sugar resource to pollinators, not a protein or lipid source. So, you know, we have the asters with like high lipid, low protein, the lamiaceae, which is high carbohydrates, low protein, and then there's the legumes, the Fabaceae. They have uh, very, they're known to have very high protein, very high quality, uh, pollen quality, but their flowers are very difficult to access for most insects. So a lot of, uh, for example, if you imagine the pea flower, it has a keel, mm -hmm. uh, keel petal, and not all insects can open those flowers. Usually it's certain types of bees, bumblebees and leaf cutter bees that can open those keel petals to access that pollen. Other types of legumes need to be buzz pollinated. So we include a species Santa Marilandica that requires buzz pollination. That means that an insect in order to get the pollen has to buzz at a very particular frequency. Uh, not all insects can do that. Honeybees can't do that. So bumblebees landing on those flowers have to buzz. So we have then the third category, which is a high quality resource that's very restrictive and very difficult to access. So 
those were the reasons we chose those three families. And we should probably point out too, just in case anybody's wondering, this whole question of pollen and the nutrition of the pollen yes. is really, really important, especially for bees, because the brood, the baby bees, that's what they eat is pollen. So the nectar is a really good source of food for the adults, but your baby bees need to have the pollen resources as well. Yeah, it's really interesting bee nutrition because essentially all bees are central place foragers and the females will collect pollen and bring that back to their nest site, wherever that is, and make a pollen provision, sometimes a ball of pollen, for example, on which they lay a single egg. And then they'll close that nest cell. So when the egg hatches, the bee larva, which I affectionately call a pollen sausage, just <laughs> stuffs itself. It has no limbs. It has no ability to move. It swims around in its pollen provision, eating until it's ready to pupate. Um, so it's the entire nutrition is dependent on what that mother bee collects for it. Uh, there's no access to any kind of outside source of food once once she closes the nest cell, that's all the developing larva has access to. So it's very important. And the quality of that pollen provision will determine the adult size of the bee, um, which will determine its fitness later in life. So that pollen is critical to the health of bees. Adult female bees will eat some pollen as well. They need that extra protein for making eggs. But male bees just eat nectar. They, they don't need any kind of protein resource, basically. Yeah, I think that's important because I think a lot of people, when they're thinking about planting for pollinators or something like that, we're thinking more nectar resources and we forget the importance of the pollen. But that again goes back to that nutritional piece that we are talking about that does so often get forgotten. I mean, the the nectar is important because you'll often, if you're going just on numbers of insects, and this is directly relevant to the extension publication, um, if you're just going by numbers of insects visiting that plant, well, the nectar is going to probably be a big driver of that because yes. anything can access it, and uh, including males and females, so you just have a much broader interest. And I often call nectar the Gatorade of the insect world. It's, it's like an energy drink that the insects need to keep living their lives. But it's not as important for reproduction. So the most popular plant that we found in our study was Pycnanthemum muticum, the mountain mint. And the mountain mints produce copious nectar, and they have this wonderful aroma, which is probably advertising that copious nectar. And they attract tons of different kinds of insects, not just bees, to that copious nectar. Yeah, I tell people all the time that if you want to have lots and lots of insects visiting your flowers, especially during the summer and early yeah. fall, plant the mountain mints. I don't care which one it is, plant yes. the mountain mints. Whatever's native to your area, you can get. There will be lots of activity if you plant a mountain mint. Lots of things to look at. In terms of that protein, uh, maybe not our best candidate, but when we're looking at just raw numbers of insects, definitely your mountain mint is going to be your top contender in that selection of species that we compared by far. Yes. And that's where, again, we kind of get back to something else you said at the very beginning is that bees, well, most insects really need a diverse diet. Yes. Just like people. I mean, we need very diverse diets. And so having multiple different things, I mean, if the only thing you planted was mountain mints, then there would be issues because, well, mountain mints don't bloom in the early spring and you've got to have something to feed them at that time too. But there, I mean, there's all kinds of issues. And again, we could pick this apart and go into a million different variations there. But we like to recommend mountain mint anyway, because yes. first of all, you know, when it comes to a gardener or, or someone planting in their in their garden, um, there are other things aside from that nutritional quality of the plant that matter to a gardener. For example, is this plant going to take over my yard? Is it going to be, is it going to die every time I try to grow it? You know, there are other challenges associated with gardening. And yes. the pycnanthemum is also great because it's easy to grow. <laughs> it, 
you know, it has this advantage that it's very popular with the pollinators. It's also popular with gardeners because it's, it's hard very, to kill. <laughs> yeah, it's a great plant. So we don't mind recommending it, even if it's just providing that nectar resource. And I found that when I recommend mountain mints, a lot of people get scared because it's a mint and they're thinking the culinary mints that just take over everything. And I'm like, no, it's, it's a mint. It's going to spread. But at least in my experience, it spreads just the right amount. Yes. Yeah. It, it doesn't I, take I over, but you got to give it a little space. Well, it'll spread, but it won't necessarily outcompete its neighbors is yes. what we found. So you don't have to pull it up because it, it spreads to the edge of the other plants and then stops. Uh, we have other plant species in this experiment that will not stop. <laughs> yes. Probably chief among those is Lycopus virginicus, which is you know, it's an interesting plant. It's an extremely interesting plant. So if you like interesting plants, I recommend my focus. However, you should be warned that it will take over everything. Uh, it spread beyond the edges of our plots into other <laughs> habitat. Uh, it's it's like meters away from our plots at this point, growing and, and dominating. So uh, it's apparently a rare native plant uh, that's rarely seen, but I don't know why it's rare because it's absolutely dominant. <laughs> And for those that may not know, which one's Lycopis? Uh, it has a really strange common name. I think it's water whorehound, and I've never seen it anywhere else other than uh, Overhill Gardens. I've never seen it advertised. I've never seen it planted anywhere. It's a strange plant. Yeah, I was going to say, because that's not one that I recognize either. Yeah. We generally call them by their Latin names because common names can be misleading. So confusing. <laughs> uh, however, yeah, it's not one I've seen before. I'll, I'll put it out. It's not common in garden centers or anything. Uh, so it would take some effort to find it if someone's interested in finding it. However, it is very strange and unique. So people out there are people out there who like unique plants. I recommend them. As long as you're not afraid of it. Uh, kind of intimidating <laughs> pick your place wisely if you choose. yeah <laughs> yeah plant it in a bunch of invasive something because uh, it will compete were there other results that you wanted to talk about with that yeah so in the publication we include a, a phenology graph which is basically showing when each of the plant species bloomed across the season and when their peak bloom was so as we were saying before, one of the things we encourage is that diversity of different plants and having a resource at different times of year is really nice. We picked a top species from each of the three families that we thought was, was best for pollinators. Uh, and that was based on how easy are they to grow as well as how popular are they. So the, the top species, it was interesting because uh, there's this kind of competing notion of well, what do we think the gardeners will like best versus what do we think the insects like best? <laughs> um, yeah, but some of my favorite plants do, don't necessarily coincide with the recommendations either. So I have to put in a plug for my favorites uh, based on nothing at all, except for I love them. Uh, <laughs> Which that's actually a really good reason to plant something though, because it's your garden. You're not talking about out in the wild. So you want things that look nice for you too. And it's finding that balance. I mean, my preference for aesthetics probably does not match up with most gardeners uh, based on people's reactions to my garden. <laughs> so the things I think be are beautiful are, are not necessarily what everyone thinks are beautiful. But I really like so the Thabesi, the legume family. One of the, I think one of the, constraints or drawbacks of this study was that the Fab AC was very difficult to establish. So they were really only getting their roots in year three, whereas the asters and the mints, they took off immediately in year one, were immediately flowering, immediately popular. Some of our legume species didn't even start blooming until the third year. Uh, and even then, their bloom was small and then has grown slowly over time. So the Baptisias, which actually are a popular plant in gardens, we found that they take you know, three years before they really start blooming well. Uh, and then they're popular, but if you go based on just the results of the first couple of years of the study, you wouldn't see that they were very popular. So that's one constraint. Uh, 
uh, I particularly liked two of these um, legume species. One was Lespedisa herta. Uh, it is, what's the common name for that? Hairy Lespedisa, I think. I think so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it has these teeny tiny little pea flowers. So they're white and they have an itty bitty little purple mark on them. And I love them. And I think they are beautiful. Their, their leaves are beautiful even before they bloom. Like when in the spring, when they're first emerging, they have these you know slightly fuzzy leaves that are a little bit red. Uh, they're really beautiful. So I love that one. Um, it is a diva. It takes forever to establish. It's you know very easy to kill. So you have to be willing to work with it. Um, and the other one I really liked was the Amorpha herbacea. I have seen a lot of Amorpha fruticosa in gardens and plantings. Amorpha fruticosa is a huge plant. It's like a it's like a shrub or small tree. Mm -hmm. uh, Amorpha herbacea is tiny. It's a tiny plant. The tallest one we have is maybe a foot tall. Oh, nice. And we had one that stayed three centimeters tall for an entire year. <laughs> so, oh, wow. so they're really little, um, but when they're happy, they get to like a foot or two tall and they have these long racings of flowers that are purple with bright orange pollen and they're beautiful. I love them. Their foliage is, is fern-like. They're really beautiful plants. So I love them, even though they're small and difficult. <laughs> So I, I wanted to put in a plug for those two Fabaceae species, even though they wouldn't be necessarily like recommended. Um, I mean, I think we did recommend them in the publication, but it has more to do with my love of them than the visitation numbers that we got. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's really good to know too, because everybody's gonna have different areas yes. and different situations. And I know I grow a more for fruticosa, the, false indigo yes. bush yeah. um and i've got some of those planted around my house but now next after listening to you i'm gonna have to look at the other yeah, one a little bit so too cute. because <laughs> cause there's places where you want something yes. small and cute oh. and not necessarily the bigger tall the other plant. small cute plant that i think would be really good in gardens was the cumberland rosemary that's conradina versalata that plant it was a real showstopper. It's beautiful foliage. It smells wonderful. Uh, has these beautiful purple flowers when it blooms in the spring. It blooms the earliest. It's our, our first bloom. And uh, bees love it. it. It does take a long time to grow and establish again. It's woody, so it, you know, it has this like low growing, slow spread. But that one's really beautiful too. Sorry, I could talk about all the plants. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure you're like me with that. And it's like, oh, but this one's my favorite. And that yes. one's my favorite. And this one's my favorite because it, and they're all my favorite. Yeah, on some level, I would say the only plant that I would regularly uh, find distasteful was the, the Lycopis, the water horehound. And that's just because it, you know, it was aggressively spreading into the other plants. We were constantly having to weed it out. Otherwise, it would outcompete everything in the block. And then, even then, it didn't seem to provide any pollen at all. So it's only nectar. So yeah, it wasn't my favorite, but the others are better. And one of the reasons why I really did like the project that you did was that you really focused on plants of East Tennessee that you could yes, get. I yeah. mean, you even say so in the title. And so often, when you look on the internet or in books, it's plant these things for pollinators. These are the best plants for pollinators. As if all pollinators are the same and all areas are the same. And as much as everybody, myself included, and I'm sure you would say the same thing, would like the easy route of, say, of being able to say, here's yeah. a prescription, let me go get them and plant these plants and they'll just be the best. And that doesn't work because what's the best in East Tennessee in the mountains might not be the best in West Tennessee next to the Mississippi River. And that's within one state, much less let's go to Maine yes. or Florida or out to California or Texas. And then one garden setting may not be the same as the other garden setting, even within East Tennessee. There's just so many variables. And that's why you had to control everything the way you yeah. did and why you couldn't do everything right. because you had to control those variables and make it very specific. There is, you know, there is some... There are some generalizations you can make mm -hmm. and not like across the board, but 
you know, we see some certain genera of plants are regularly consistently pollinator favorites or well visited at least, you know, across the eastern seaboard. So I've, I've worked in New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia. We consistently see these genera coming up over and over again in terms of that like abundant pollinator community. I think what's missed by that, and again, what is lacking from these recommendations we provide are those, you know, specialist bees or specialist plants that are less noticeable that might still be an important ecological community and that diversity. So in the end, diversity wins. Uh, the more diverse the plants you can put, the better. But I, I think that's, it's harder to manage a really diverse garden. So for your average gardener, <laughs> the number of species should be, you know, it, it's hard to have that many species in your garden. Yeah. And then you get diminishing returns too, because your bees, uh, if we're just going to focus on bees yeah. and ignore all the other flower visitors yeah. and potential pollinators, but just to make it simple, let's just focus on bees. Bees tend to be very loyal yeah. to one's plant species at a time as they're visiting. So if you have one of everything, that's not going to probably be as effective as having, say, three or four or five of the same species. I'm going to push back on that a little okay. bit because I think that concept comes from studies of honeybees and honeybee workers when they're foraging do have a really high what they call floral constancy. Mm -hmm. So your average honeybee worker and I've looked at the pollen loads that they carry to just look at like basically the purity of the pollen. How many different types of pollen are they collecting on a given foraging load? For honeybees it's like 99% one type of pollen on a foraging load. For other types of bees, I'm not sure that applies to the same extent. So bumblebees, you know, they might forage from multiple different plants in a, in a little garden. You can see them move from plant to plant mm -hmm. within our uh, six species plots. Um, and other kinds of insects also are not as loyal to a given <laughs> plant species, for better or for worse. They, they will move from plant to plant and you can watch them move from plant to plant within, uh, within a plot. So I don't know, I think that the concept of floral constancy, which I've heard many times, I think that is a honeybee thing. And for a social insect that has, you know, this huge hive, it makes a lot of sense for an individual to specialize and bring mm -hmm. that resource back. And honeybees do need really large batches of, of floral resources. For other types of bees, maybe solitary bees or other types of insects, I'm not sure that you have to have a huge patch of one type of flower um, to supply everything they need. There is this weird asymmetry in these interactions. So plant species that are really generalized, like visited by many different species of insects, tend to also be visited by specialist insects that only visit one type of plant. And, and that's also true of the opposite. So bees that are really generalized tend to visit plants that are only visited by that bee. So it's kind of an interesting asymmetric interaction. And, and there are lots of hypotheses about why that would be. But, but yeah, I think, I think it's a little bit more complicated. I'm not sure that having small numbers of plants should be discouraged because <laughs> I think just promoting that diversity is still helpful. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you, you kind of think about the mosaic of different gardens that are out there uh, and that mosaic of resources that's constantly changing. One of the things I've learned about these is that they are very opportunistic. So it, even if there's a resource they've never seen before that suddenly appears, they'll be visiting it. Uh, like we were planting an invasive thistle from a pot into the ground and it was blooming while we were planting it. And while we were digging into the ground, bees were visiting the flowers. Like they didn't need any time to get to know that resource. <laughs> they, they were flying overhead and had never been there before. And they were like, there's a flower, we're gonna visit. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I think bees are surprisingly adaptable. <laughs> yeah, that is a good point there. Yeah. yeah, most of the studies I've seen with the floral constancy are honeybee based, but then I've seen a few that seem to suggest that maybe at least some species of bees, um, especially bumblebees, which I mean, they've got a social structure too there, are maybe not as specific as honeybees, but yeah. definitely have some. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I watched the bumblebees go from 
one species to another all the time. I mean, I watched one yesterday go from cut plant Sylphium perforatum to tall iron, Veronia giganica. Bumblebees are like the honeybees' chaotic cousin. I mean, they are, they don't really follow any rules, <laughs> the same rules that the honeybees follow. And honeybees, remember, I mean, honeybees are a non native species exactly. in America, and they are also really unusual. Uh, that makes them fascinating, but it also means that the rules we learn from them might not apply to our native bees, North American bees, because they're just, they're extremely different in, in both their, their behavior, you know, their phylogenetic history, they're not that closely related to anything we have here. Um, they're fascinating bee species, but I, I think we, you know, we should pause before we apply the lessons we've learned from honeybees to all of the bees. I agree with that. And I think more and more research is starting to look at those differences too, which is really important as well. Honeybees are just, they're so uh, familiar to people. You know, they are our most studied bee species easily. Um, we know how to manage them. We know how to rear them. We understand them better than the other bees. Some people would argue we still don't understand them that well, but we certainly understand them better than everything else. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, this has been really, really fascinating and interesting. <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? I think the general recommendations I provide to people who are interested in pollinator conservation, uh, generally we just recommend no matter how small the space you have, the more flowers, the better. So even if you just have an apartment balcony, having a blooming plant on the balcony, that helps. Every little bit helps. Uh, one of the best things about pollinator conservation is that there's nothing too small. <laughs> and the other great thing about pollinator conservation is that in a lot of ways, less is more. So we'll often encourage people to mow your lawn less often, uh, apply fewer chemicals, just, just do less. Pollinators really like wild habitat. So mm -hmm. you don't need to be obsessively tidy. You can leave parts of your lawn unmown and things like that. Let them bloom, see what visits. Um, and we have often, you know, people will run into this issue where their homeowners association doesn't like messy lawns. So we often say, you know, you could argue that you're doing that for pollinator conservation. So pollinator conservation is a good excuse to be a little bit lazy uh, with your lawn management. Um, but yeah, the, the more flowers, the better. There's no reason to, you know, we try to provide evidence-based recommendations for the best of the plant species to plant, but whatever you're planting is great. And anybody who puts flowers out there is helping in some way or another. Yes, exactly. And when we say best yes, with this, you're not saying these are the best of everything that, that's out there. You're saying these are the best of the ones that we tested in this location. <laughs> yes. And like you said, you couldn't test everything and you want to have everything from one spot. So yeah, when I read it, I was like, well, why didn't they test this genus? Yeah, because <laughs> what genus did you want most? Um, I was surprised you didn't have this in four trichums for your asters. Um, yeah, because they are so common, so many places that you can get both get them and because they're so common out in the wild. Two points on that. One, I have done previous work on Cynthia trichums. Um, so that was in Pennsylvania, but mm -hmm. it's a familiar genus. And then two, the Eurebia used to be a symbiotrichum. And oh. some symbiotrichum used to be Eurebia. So you can't tell me that they're not at least somewhat overlapping in their oh, yes. <laughs> ecological role. Um, I know a taxonomist would uh, get very angry with me for saying something like that. But the the, the genera, do, especially within the Asteraceae, the genera sometimes move around a little bit. So and Especially with the asters, yes. Yeah. I mean, I learned them all as aster. Uh, yes. as that being the genus and so then you open up the book a few years later and it's like oh yeah the asteroids you get complicated so from that perspective I would say um not that we have the Cynthia trichum covered because of course not but that you know the Eurebia could be a stand-in or is probably representative of the behavior of Cynthia trichum in this uh case. It blooms at a similar time, has very similar flowers. <laughs> yes. And again, we get to the, you can't test every single species or every yeah. single genus, but, and your reasoning for testing the 18 that you tested makes perfect sense. Yes. And actually there was a, this 
publication got shared on Facebook, uh, and it got shared to an East Tennessee uh, nature lovers group. And you should see all of the things people wanted. <laughs> There's a long list of complaints under that article. Well, why didn't you have any milkweed? So I don't understand why there's no geranium here, and so on and so forth. And so forth. Oh, yeah. And knowing that most of our fall asters used to be aster as the genus. I was kind of like, okay, yeah, that's probably why. Yeah, I'm just going to, in my mind, substitute those where it works better because yeah, that makes sense. And like you said, looking at those generalities, going with kind of the, what the genera are, if you don't necessarily have the species. Yes. And one of the challenges too is, you know, so the asters tend to bloom late in the summer. The mints tend to bloom earlier. You know, so we were trying to get the families to overlap in their timing of bloom to some extent. So that time of bloom wasn't a confounding variable in comparing the different plant families. Um, and to that extent, you know, some of the plant species we chose were because they were blooming on the far end of that range of bloom. And if we had picked the Cynthia trichum, they would bloom even later in the summer uh, compared to the Arabia, which is a little bit earlier. Most of the asters are so late. Like, uh, Verbicina occidentalis doesn't even bloom, it hasn't even started blooming yet. It won't bloom until like almost October. So, yes. um, whereas we had the Conradina blooming in April. So mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to compress this growing season a little bit, but to, you know, within the constraints of the plant families. You know. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it was an excellent study. I love the, re the uh, <laughs> results coming out and all the different applications for it and stuff. And I mean, yeah, we can always do more, but yes. that's again, unlimited resources, unlimited time, unlimited everything. Yes. You know, those people get real quiet when I say, well, we would love to test your species. Just give us some funding and we <laughs> will, we will test your favorite species. <laughs> yes. And then they get quiet. They don't have that kind of funding. Uh, yes, exactly. But yeah, hopefully you'll be able to keep doing some more great research because yeah I think this is really interesting and all those projects you've got going on with it oh my gosh those sounded so fascinating and interesting and, but yeah this has been like I said really interesting and thank you so much for coming on and talking with us today yeah thank you for having me oh you're welcome and I will definitely put links in the show notes to that publication that sounds great thank you right, yeah well thanks again and have a great day you too bye. thanks bye I really appreciate Laura taking the time to talk with us today. No project can ever test every single flowering plant out there under every single condition possible. But research like what Laura and her colleagues are doing is still really important. And you don't have to live in East Tennessee for this research to be valuable, especially when you look at this research in conjunction with similar research from other areas. By looking at projects from a variety of locations, patterns can emerge, such as the mountain mints frequently ranking high in the number of flower visitors, regardless of where the study is conducted in the eastern U.S. These patterns can give us hints as to generalizations that we can make and point us in potential directions to go in the absence of exhaustive research in our exact location. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider making a donation. You can find out how at www.backyardecology.net slash support. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.